the addictive process that we're going to talk about tonight has three sections. The first section is how it starts. What is the catalyst to addiction? Right? So what are the environments? What are the environments? What are the conditions that first instigate that addictive loop? What, what gets people in it? Okay? And we're going to analyze Tinder in the context of that. Number two, we're going to have a look at, okay, once people have got in that loop, they've started the addictive loop, right? You've attracted them, you've engaged them, you've piqued their curiosity. Once they're in, what are the systematic steps that you can take to take them all the way around? We're going to look at Snapchat in that context. And the last one, we're going to look at the implications. Once people are on your platform, once you've created a habit, once people can no longer control how often and how intensely they use your product, we're going to analyze what are the implications on both the business and also the users. Okay? So let's start. Who can hazard a guess what they think might cause an addiction? Not at all using what's on the board. Like, who, can, who just thinks they can guess what starts an addiction? Anybody? Yes, I heard dopamine. A cue, was that a cue? Yep. Did we have anyone over here? Cool. Now, I'm glad the idea of dopamine came up because that's gonna be a central part of this, this first stage, right? What we have to do again is break that down. So put your hands up if you know what dopamine is or you've heard about it before. Cool, a really large majority of people. Okay, for the purpose of tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to simplify the definition of dopamine, okay? Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, which means it's a chemical released, and it's released in the pleasure centers of the brain. So for the purpose of tonight, what we can say is that an increase in dopamine will increase our feelings of pleasure, okay? That's the only connection I want you guys to remember tonight, okay? So what you have to also consider is that humans, inherently speaking, are pleasure-seeking people. Pleasure-seeking species, animals, whatever you want to call us, right? So what are we always going to be seeking? We're going to be seeking pleasure. We break that process down. We understand that we get pleasure when we get increased dopamine. So working backwards from that, what do we have to figure out? Yeah, how do we increase dopamine? Absolutely, right? And the way we increase dopamine, ladies and gentlemen, is when we satisfy needs or we make ourselves happy. Not like that, okay? That probably works, but not like that. So let's break down what types of needs we need. Physiologically speaking, there's this idea of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So Maslow's hierarchy, for those who don't know, is a pyramid. At the base of the pyramid are most, our most fundamental needs, things like sex, I don't know why I said that first, but things like sex, <laughs> things like food, things like water. Next layer up, things like safety, shelter, physical safety. Next layer up, self-esteem. Next layer up again, is we're gonna start looking at self-actualization. That's just when you have like an existentialist fulfillment, right? You understand the purpose of life, you're morally enlightened, all these things, right? When we can fulfill one of these needs, our body will release dopamine. That's all you have to remember. When you can fulfill one of these inherent needs that we all have, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to be in that order, but when you do that, your body's happy for that. And when your body's happy that you've satisfied its needs, what happens? It releases more dopamine. When you release more dopamine, you increase the feeling of Pleasure, that's right. You get your body to start feeling pleasure, it will thank you for that. And what will happen is it will keep coming back. It forms an association. It says that this activity led me all the way through to make me feel happy, made me feel pleasure. So I'm gonna go back to that activity, okay? That's how the addictive loop starts. You satisfy a need, ladies and gentlemen, and from there, 
You increase dopamine, you increase pleasure, and you get people liking that connection between a stimulus and an outcome. So now we're going to have a look at Tinder. It's a pretty obvious one. The hint is there's actually two. But what are two needs that you think Tinder fulfills? Validation. What was that one? Sorry? Validation. Elimination? Validation. Validation? Yeah, that's absolutely one, right? So that's the second one. And social validation is, is one that Tinder absolutely fulfills. The first one's pretty easy, right? It's, it's sexual interest or like a feeling of romance, feeling of acceptance, okay? They're the two. So let's have a look how Tinder do it so well. What happens when you first open Tinder? What, what does everybody see when they first open Tinder? Not saying I've used it, okay? This will may probably divide the audience. Actually, it certainly will divide the audience, whoever calls out. But what do you first see when you open Tinder? Pictures, whoever said that, dead on. Like, that's absolutely true, okay? You see pictures when you first open Tinder. What is pictures more likely to encourage from the users, right? When you can physically see somebody, you're more likely to be physically attracted to them, okay? Despite what people say about falling in love with personalities, you can't fall in love with words straight away, right? Biologically speaking, your brain will see pictures first. So Tinder open with pictures, okay? They engage the limbic system. That's the part of the brain responsible for your attention and your emotions. That part of the brain operates with pictures, operates with visuals. So when Tinder opens with visuals, what happens is it takes you the fastest route possible to spike that dopamine. Because it takes you the fastest route possible to satisfy that very basic need of sexual attraction. Does that all make sense? Okay, here's something I want to introduce. And when, the first time I heard this, it blew my mind but it was also an epiphany that made everything very clear. And that is the anticipation for reward, okay? And what we classify it as reward is something that solves our needs. Like we classify that as a reward. The anticipation for a reward is seen more favorably in the brain than the receipt of the reward itself. I'm so sorry for this microphone. Is, is seen more importantly than the reward itself, right? So what that means is that when you anticipate a reward before you've even received it, your brain will spike dopamine more than when you actually get that reward, okay? And this is why it works